So welcome to our presentation on how to scale job triggering with a distributed scheduler. And we're going to present it in the context of DAP, the DAPR project and how that help us solve some scaling problems that we had in the project. Uh, my name is Arthur Souza. And I'm Cassie Coyle, a software engineer at Diagrid, where I am an approver for the Dapper Runtime project along with the Java SDK. Yeah, and uh, head of engineering at uh, Diagrid and maintainer of Dapper for the last five years. Um, and so if you want to reach out to us, here's our contact information. So here's some agenda of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, I'm going to start by in showing, I'll talk a little bit about Dapper, the architecture that we have, go deeper into actors, actor reminders, and Dapper workflow. And that will be a segue for you to understand why we had this need in the Dapper project. Um, and it might also be helpful for the project you have if you're having similar problems. Okay, so introduction to Dapper. Um, is anyone here familiar with the Dapper project? Okay, quite a few. Is anyone running Dapper in production? A few, some of the half production. What is, what is half production? The product's not ready yet. Okay, so in the development, okay, I, I get that. So stop by our booth if you want to talk about that too. Okay, uh, so for those that don't know, I'm going to give a quick uh, overview. So imagine that you have an application with multiple microservices and you want to do service invocation. Uh, you usually have to configure your application to know the endpoint of each service um, or use a service mesh. In case it's Dapper, you make an API call to the Dapper API saying calls, call service B or call service C or A. And Dapper will handle the invocation for you. We do MTLS. We also do retries, uh, all that configurable, including tracing as well and metrics. The same thing happens for PubSub. When you do a publisher message, you can publish to Kafka or publish to Azure Service Bus um, or publish to uh, SQS. All that is yeah, distracted from the application because Dapper offers the API for you. Um, on top of those primitives, we also offer actors with, with virtual actors and also workflow, which was built on top of um, actors. Uh, so this is like a high-level overview of what Dapper can do for you, and uh, you can check our website for more information. Here's some, some of the uh, APIs. We have Jobs API we're going to talk about today, Workflow, Disability Law, Configuration, Secrets, uh, Observability, Actors, uh, what is that? Uh, binding, PubSub, State Management, and Service Invocation. And all that runs on Kubernetes. So Dapper runs as a separate process, as a sidecar. Um, you can also run without Kubernetes if you want, but it's, we really build for Kubernetes as well. And I'm going to show you why. Um, we also offer SDKs on different programming languages, and you can talk via HTTP or gRPC. If you want to skip the uh, SDKs, you also can do that. Just talk directly with APIs. Uh, so check out more information about Dapper. And Dapper recently graduated. Yay! <laughs> So these are some of the stats of our project. Uh, we are now 14th project out of all the CNCF projects. We have quite a few contributors, quite a few stars. Uh, it's been going on for five years, like I mentioned. Uh, the Dapper's architecture. So this project will be most focus focused on running Dapper on Kubernetes, okay? Imagine you have a Kubernetes cluster and and in this case, it installed, Dapper is installed in the Dapper system namespace. There are a few control plane services you're going to notice. One of them is a sidecar injector, which is a mutating webhook that will modify the pod template to inject a Dapper sidecar with the correct configurations based on your annotations on your deployment. Or also, it can be a job uh, or a stateful set. Um, so that will be automatically mutated and injected for you. Uh, we have Sentry, which handles MTLS certificates. Uh, it implements this PV uh, protocol. We have the operator, which is the interface between the sidecar and the Kubernetes APIs. The sidecar does not have a direct dependency on the, the Kubernetes API. It's, it's agnostic. But 
because you're deploying Kubernetes, the operator is what allows the sidecar to see which components you have configured and other settings. We have placement, which we're gonna talk more about today, which keeps um, a, uh, almost like a, uh, we call it a placement table, which maps for each actor type, which sidecar instances host that particular actor type. And, and that's gonna be important for today's talk. And brand new, uh, we have the scheduler, which handles the storage and triggering of cron jobs like type of uh, 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 triggers. And for the first time, it has a persistent storage. So placement, although it's a stateful set and has uh, store, storage as well, the, the table, it can be recreated easily via just starting over. Versus now in scheduler, the jobs are persisted there and it has to be durable. So it's the first time that we have actually a control plane that requires durability. And, and again, in the pod of your application, you're gonna have the sidecar and we call it DAPRD. Um, Okay, let's go to the next step. So actors, how actors work in Dapper. Who, who here is familiar with the concept of virtual actors? Okay, one person, okay, great. Um, that's basically what implement in Dapper, implement virtual actors, which means that you don't need to instantiate, is the kind of virtually always present. You can invoke any actor at any time, and Dapper will figure out which instance is supposed to receive that invocation. And there is a single threaded concurrency guarantee for each invocation with turn-based concurrency. So if two calls to the same actor ID takes place, one of them will win and get executed before the next one. And that also allows some kind of state caching. In this example, if the application is making invocation to an actor uh, on, on the, the number one here, number one arrow, it will figure out that it's not hosted here, actor number three, for, imagine what actor is it as our actor type, and three is the actor ID. It's not hosted here, and it will redirect the call to the next sidecar that actually hosted, as you can see, and this one will actually the one we're gonna be processing the request. All that is done behind the scenes for you. Uh, it's just, a, looks like an invocation to a method in a class. And it's highly recommend that you do that using one of the SDKs that implements actors. And here you're gonna see the placement service uh, being used. So every Dapper sidecar, even if it does not host actors, has a copy of the placement table. Uh, the ones that host actors, it, it kind of announces to the placement service, I am um, sidecar, I don't know, one, two, three, with this IP address, and I'm hosting actor type, uh, in this example, uh, actor type, just actor type, this actor type is an example, but could say order type or any other actor type that you have. And placement service will basically keep a map. This actor type has this, this and that instance serving it, and that will be used for consistent hashing. Uh, and since because that is copied or uh, disseminated to every single sidecar, when you invoke an actor in Dapper, it's a local decision in the sidecar. You don't have to do a lookup on the placement service, it's a local decision, and then you redirect to whatever sidecar you need to. And that, also, of course, is also done with MTLS. Now we go to actor reminders. What is actor reminders? Actor reminders, imagine like a cron job for actors. You can say, let's say have an order to be processed, and you wanna have a reminder to try to process the payment every hour, for example, or try to uh, do the accounting reconciliation for the order. And that has to be done on a schedule for, for whatever reason. And it can also be like a single trigger, let's say call me within an hour, but call it only once. Uh, we do support that kind of calls in the actor reminders. But basically the way you do it is you make an invocation to the sidecar, say register this reminder. And if you're using the Dapper SDK, that is done behind the scenes for you, don't need to, care, to worry too much about the API. And the sidecar will basically read and write reminders from the state store. And that state store is used to also load the reminders when the sidecar starts up and because the reminders can be for multiple actors, that is partitioned across all the sidecars. And only 
the reminders that, per, that belong to the, to the actor IDs that are owned by this sidecar, uh, they're going to be loaded. And the other ones are going to be loaded by the other one and the other one. And if there's any kind of change of membership, there's a rebalancing, which means some reminders might move from one host to another. And uh, that's a high level of how actor reminders work today before the introduction of the scheduler service. But there's a problem. The actual state store API does not offer a list API. <clears throat> and even with the list, it does not offer consistency. But the way it was really designed is that there will be a record with like actors and the actor type and the, act and the sorry, actors and the actor type right after. In this case, customer's actor type. And then it would list every single reminder. As you can see, that would quickly fall short because of limitations of databases of record size. If you use CosmoDB or DynamoDB or many other databases, there's a limit of how big this can be. So users were hitting this limitation really quickly and could not register many reminders. So we had a, like a, a new design, or I would say almost like a workaround, where we would partition the data into multiple records, and you could dis decide how many partitions you have up front, like let's say seven, 10, and that would basically spread the list of reminders across multiple records. So that would alleviate the, the, the problem. And here's you can see an example, how there's like a random ID, and how this random ID is used to separate this metadata instance from others. And uh, there's some reason why this metadata is here. Um, it's not really the reason for this, uh, the topic for this presentation, but that allows us to, that when you change the partition number, it will make a new ID for this and avoid kind of risk conditions um, um, in the database. Um, but that is just an implementation detail. So we had some, still some really big limitations to actual reminders even after this. A really low throughput, so you can only write your reminders at the rate of 45 give or take TPS. So writing 45 reminders per second is really, really low uh, for most production workloads. And you cannot scale horizontally or vertically. There's nothing you can do to scale the TPS. Um, adding more sidecars does not help. Uh, adding more partitions does not help too much either with the TPS. It can only help with the um, size, with how many you can store, but not with the TPS. So we kind of end up hitting like a practical limit of like a thousand reminders. That's how much you could register. And again, and rebalancing was required every time an application product goes up and down. Um, on a rolling deployment that you would do in your cluster, that would cause a rebalance and the, re the reminder might be down for, for a few seconds. Dapper workflow. Now let's go re really quick on Dapper workflow because Dapper workflow uses actors behind the scenes. It's called internal actors. What does it mean? It means that it has the runtime uh, uh, implemented, but the actor function implementations, or the math implementations of the actor, are no longer in the application. They are in the Dapper sidecar itself. It's used to used on the application for you to implement the, the activities. So workflow activities or the authoring of the workflow, they are all in, in the SDK, in the specific SDK for Dapper workflow that you can see in the most programming languages that we listed early on. And actor, and then Dapper workflow, user reminders. There's a reminder called start, there's a reminder for a new event, there's a reminder for a timer, and there's a reminder for a run activity. And all that is to guarantee the, the, the long running uh, capabilities of, of workflows. And, and the sidecar and the, and the application, they, they talk to each other through a gRPC streaming, where you can get the work item stream, you, you, you get work items and get executed on the application, and then the results are sent back to the Dapper sidecar. This is a high level of how Dapper workflow work. Um, it's not a presentation about Dapper workflow either. There, there are some nice talks about that. Uh, if you can go online, you can see on the Dapper YouTube channel. There's one really good from Chris Gillen from Microsoft. And still have limitations. We found like a practical limit of like about 100 activities, and it can only run with, with two replicas. 
So it was really alpha stage uh, at that point. And uh, Cassie and the open source team of Diagri have been working really hard to uh, redesign um, uh, from a lot of the decisions that were made early on to make this scale. Cassie. All righty. Let's get into the scheduler. So the scheduler is a brand new control plane service deployed by default with a Dapper init. It runs in Kubernetes mode and standalone mode as a single instance or in HA mode. So one or three instances respectfully. The capabilities of the scheduler are to store jobs to be triggered at some point in the future while guaranteeing that only one scheduler is gonna send back that job. So you don't have to worry about you know, multiple schedulers sending back the same job. And I'll explain how we do that here in a bit. Implementation wise, the scheduler includes an embedded etcd database and an internal cron scheduling library, which is the glue that makes it all work. Design decisions for the scheduler are as follows. It is to be an orchestrator, not executor. So the scheduler, um, from the spe scheduler's perspective, it simply takes in a job and then it sends it back at trigger time. And then like you can you know, register a handler funk um, using an SDK if you want to go execute you know, the specific business logic. But from the scheduler, it just sends it back to the sidecar. And then we do guarantee at least one um, job execution. This was for workflow, as Archer had mentioned, for durability. And we did have a bias towards durability and scaling over the clock time precision. So we guarantee that a job is never going to be invoked before its schedule is due. But we don't necessarily guarantee you know, a ceiling time for when it's invoked after that um, due time is reached. And this is because you know, it's possible to get behind on triggers for whatever reason, but we do guarantee that we will never lose a trigger and we do catch up but that clock time precision you know, might get a tiny bit behind. And then the scheduler was written to be generic for multi-job um, like purpose. So it's extensible, we can create various types of jobs. We'll go into that here in a bit too. And scale and performance were really key for us when we were designing and implementing the scheduler to you know, scale actor reminders and workflows. Now let's get into how does it work. So the scheduler is you know, a single binary that includes an embedded etcd database. So you won't see you know, multiple binaries, it's just one scheduler. And then that does include the cron scheduling library. As I mentioned, it is the glue to kind of make it all work. And here is actually the Go code for how we are spinning up our scheduler service. The concurrency new runner manager simply spins up Go routines and kind of manages the context for us. And so we have server.new, where we take in those server options like port, the listen address, all the way down to the etcd config, where of course we do provide same defaults, so you really don't have to do anything for it all to work out of the box, but you can like update the data directory and whatnot if you choose. And then of course we run server.run and that runs our scheduler. The ellipses is just you know, spinning up our health server, metrics exporter, security provider, those types of things. The embedded etcd um, of course is in our scheduler. We all know that etcd is a distributed key value store and that is where our jobs live. So when you schedule a job, it lives in etcd and then, you know, at trigger time, we have the cron library helping to facilitate things. With etcd, um, we do get that data consistency and replication out of the box. So you see the etcds are, you know, communicating with each other, running raft under the hood, and maintaining the quorum for us of the data. And then with that, every single scheduler has the complete set of all jobs because of you know, how etcd works. And then we are persisting data by default. So if all the schedulers go down, you know, our data is persisted. Um, alrighty, this is the Go code for how we are creating that embedded etcd. Of course, we have our import and then we're simply calling start etcd, giving it our um, config. And of course, watching for that context and shutting down appropriately. 
These are what the records look like inside our etcd. Um, the dapper is the namespace here. Leadership is for our leadership key. It is how we are dividing up jobs among schedulers. I will explain more on that here in a bit. Just know it exists. And then we have, you know, 012, which is the like the replica ID of the scheduler. And then three would be, you know, the total. So in this case, I have three schedulers running in HA mode. When you schedule a job via the jobs API, this is what that record looks like. You'll see Dapper jobs app and then, you know, so forth. This is what an actor reminder type of job looks like. Um, as Arthur had mentioned, you know, now our reminders are gonna live in here so we can scale. And then these are the actor reminders for our workflows with a like a zero um, second due time. You can see we have a start event, like a run activity and a new event here. That's a complete set, not um, shown is a job counter, which is how we are tracking the state of triggered jobs over time. Now let's talk about the internal cron scheduling library. This was a repo designed specifically for a highly distributed, highly concurrent environment to enable the scalable distributed job management. Um, and this gives us dynamic job partition leadership coordination, which is a lot of words to say job ownership. And how this works is the jobs are split up such that each scheduler owns a subset of all the jobs to trigger back. And then this enables us to have load distribution because you know as you scale out and have more schedulers, each scheduler owns like a smaller subset of all the jobs to trigger. So we're actually becoming like more performant as you scale as well. The Chrome library includes various packages to make it all work. There's a nice illustration I made to kind of show what they all look like starting with a job queue, which is an in-memory queue of our jobs. It's used to manage the scheduling and triggering of them. We have a counter. It's that counter key that is used to track the state over time. So if you have, you know, 10 repeats, two repeats, we are keeping track with the counter. We have a leadership package, which is essentially job ownership, as I mentioned, with a caveat that every scheduler is a peer there is no leader there's no follower essentially they are all equal and each scheduler is a leader for its own partition of the jobs which is the subset of the jobs and it's responsible to trigger those back and then this is dynamically recalculated such that we'll never have a loss of jobs you know if a scheduler goes down we're going to reshuffle the jobs amongst the available schedulers then we have an informer. It is watching our etcd job key space for those creates and deletes. We have a graveyard package, which is really an optimization for the expired jobs. So jobs that have exceeded the time to live, we don't have to do a queue lookup, which can be expensive based on you know, how big our queue is. And then it really prevents reprocessing of those recently deleted keys. And of course, we have a garbage collector because when you create things, we have to delete them. So this will bulk delete our keys to maintain that clean state. So every 180 seconds we clean up or um, we have a sooner channel that will be triggered if we hit 500,000 garbage keys to be collected. And this is what it looks like to run our cron library. It's pretty clean. We have cron.new where we take in those cron options like the client, the namespace, which is Dapper in our case, which is the prefix of the keys we saw. And then the partition ID in total, that's like the replica ID. And then of course the total amount of the schedulers. The trigger function is the function that gets executed, of course at, at trigger time, it's where we send the job back to, it's exposed on the scheduler. And then the replica data is the scheduler host and port. This is a new thing that's going in and actively being worked on right now, such that the sidecar can get the complete set of all active schedulers. Um, so it's not just a static set of you know, scheduler addresses. And then we call cron.run. And I also like to add, like some of you might be familiar with the Go at CD cron library. It was originally created by Rubfig and then forked by Scalingo, like another company. Uh, initially, we had a fork of it, but it changed so much that basically just the name is there. It's not the same library anymore. Okay. 
let's talk about the job ownership model, which is that dynamic leadership partitioning. So in this case, we have a single scheduler, and that scheduler is responsible for triggering every single job from zero to N. When you have three schedulers, we're running in HA mode. This is the exact line from our partitioner package. We do the partition ID mod the total partitions. That is just like the scheduler ID mod the total. Um, so roughly, we get an equivalent split of the jobs to you know, the schedulers, such that schedulers own a subset of the jobs to trigger back, sharing the load. And then because of this, we actually don't know which scheduler owns which job. So all schedule or not all schedulers, all sidecars have to connect to all schedulers to watch for the jobs. And then that is actually on a streaming connection. Um, so the, the scheduler has a connection pool of the available sidecars to send the job back to. And we will round robin between the um, the available sidecars for the same app ID. So if you have more than one, we're gonna round robin between them and send the job back on a streaming connection. Scheduler resiliency, you know, we have a lot baked in here. We have that data persistence and replication, which is a given from etcd. So every scheduler has a complete set of all the data. We're persisting by default, um, so we won't have that downtime. Then we have that dynamic job partition leadership or just like the job ownership and distribution where we are reshuffling. We have our jobs being like dynamically reshuffled upon them coming up and down and then sharing the load, of course. And then jobs are always triggered because we have a persisted counter we are keeping track of as they're being triggered. And then we do have, of course, a failure policy. So if a job is not successfully sent back, you can elect to drop it, that's completely fine. Or we do, by default, have a consistent retry for those client-side errors. And then for non-client-side errors, so say a sidecar goes down and never comes back up, but we still have jobs for that sidecar, it's just gonna live in a staging queue to be held until there is a sidecar available to send the job back to. The impact on you know, the active reminders and workflows was pretty substantial going back from version 113 to 114, which included the scheduler. We saw performance gains for active reminders um, with schedulers in HA mode, so three of them. We were able to schedule 50,000 active reminders with an average triggered QPS of roughly 4,500 which was at least a 10x improvement while keeping roughly the same QPS. And then invoking the scheduler jobs API directly, we observed a QPS of up to 35,000 for triggering, where QPS is queries per second. And going back, so you see um, for version 113, we had a QPS of creating actual reminders of 50. Now with scheduler, that is 4,000. So an 80X improvement with using the scheduler to store those reminders. Workflow performance numbers. Um, this is from running our performance tests pretty regularly, so daily. Um, we have a test to run parallel workflow tests with a max concurrent count of 60 to 90 workflows. We saw performance improvements that were 71% higher versus the old reminder system would drop by 44%. It just couldn't keep up, it couldn't handle the load. And then a high scale test where we had a max concurrent workflow count of 350 and we were running 1400 iterations, we saw performance improvements that were 50% higher than the old reminder system, where we can scale to millions of reminders and jobs in the scheduler and we are at most limited by the storage capabilities in etcd, but not the throughput of those jobs and reminders. The Dapper Jobs API is a brand new alpha API. You can schedule a job, get a job, and delete a job, and those jobs live in the scheduler. So here's a curl for what it would look like to schedule a job named text or test. And um, the data can be literally anything. I put my name there, and the job is due in three seconds. This is what is a job, this is a definition of our job, it's the proto message from our runtime code where a job will have data and then it can optionally have you know, a schedule, repeat, due time, 
time to live in a failure policy. So say you'll have a production database backup job that you want to run monthly. You could set, you know, cron expression, or you could set the schedule to be at monthly or weekly or daily. And then, you know, maybe you just want it to run for a year. If it's monthly, then you could just set 12 repeats. I don't know that I'd recommend that, but you could do it. And then, you know, you could set a due time, so a delayed start. Essentially, maybe you want it to start the first of next month. That's how you could use a due time. And then time to live is pretty self-explanatory. And then as is failure policy. The jobs API is the section between your app and the sidecar. So via gRPC and HTTP, and then the sidecar will send the job back at trigger time via the slash job event, or slash job for HTTP and the on job event for gRPC. And then with the SDK, I mentioned this earlier, but you can register a handler func that will just get called at trigger time once your app receives the job back. Putting the whole thing together, if you were to schedule a job called My Job, it'll go to the sidecar. Then the sidecar will pick up the app ID and the namespace and then send it along to the scheduler where it will live inside that etcd database. From there, you know, we have some cron library magic that is doing its thing and at trigger time, we'll send it back to any of the same app ID, like Dapper instances, on a streaming connection called Watch Jobs. And then from there, Dapper will just send that back to your app. In the future, we will be allowing even more types of jobs. Um, we have a PubSub API, so we will be enabling delayed PubSub calls. So, you know, publishing a message at a specific point in time in the future, that kind of thing. And then scheduled service invocation, another one of our APIs, enabling the schedule of method calls, you know, between your applications. And then, of course, auto-scaling the scheduler, which is just a little bit more complicated because we have the etcd database inside. Um, but beyond three, we'll you know, take out the etcd and kind of scale as is and use the existing etcd instances that will come. And then optionally storing the job data separately. If you don't want the data to live in etcd, the cron stuff will, but the data can live you know, in Postgres or another state store of your choosing. And then, of course, for feature parity with our cron binding, we will be allowing a CRD job creation such that you can run cube apply F to create a job. I want to thank everyone in this slide. Um, the scheduler was a massive project. It was very, very complicated and took a lot of work. So thank you to all the contributors. And then thank you all for being here with us. Um, we appreciate your time, and then Arthur and I will be available in the front if you'll have any questions. Okay, thank you.